spring, 1922. Irish separatists have forced Britain through a long military and political campaign to withdraw from most of the island of Ireland, bringing centuries of British rule to an end. While Northern Ireland stays within the United Kingdom, the 26-county Irish Free State gains a large degree of control over its own affairs, though it must remain part of the British Empire. The terms of the Anglo-Irish Treaty split the Irish people. I thought the treaty was a good thing for this country. It was the first chance we got to have our own regime. I wasn't going to give allegiance to any foreign king. The treaty was a watering down of all that we ever fought for. They hated it. Anti-treaty Republicans viewed the treaty as a betrayal of the Republic, declared in 1916 and 1919, and are prepared to counter the new state. They have a belief in the Republic. They are prepared to sacrifice themselves for that Republic. Anti-treaty IRA occupy evacuated British Army barracks and set up headquarters in the Four Courts. Violence flares throughout the country, and there are fears the new state will die moments after its birth. There's a sense of the apocalypse arriving for many of those on the right and many middle class groups who see Bolshevism coming out of Russia as this real danger and revolution, something that's going to spread across the world. Northern Ireland also sees conflict and death. There is a horrendous period of concentrated violence. 220 Catholics and Protestants are killed in just four months. In the Irish Free State, amid widespread calls for calm, a general election is held. The pro-treaty side wins a sizable majority, leading many to hope civil war can be avoided. But when IRA volunteers assassinate Sir Henry Wilson in London, Britain demands that Michael Collins and the Provisional Government must attack the anti-treaty IRA in the Four Courts. Irish turn on Irish. The civil war has begun. The only emotions of the people in the civil war that I seem to remember are those of hatred. It takes generations to wipe out the bitterness of a civil war. It was bloody awful, I can tell you that. the shelling. The Free State Army had been bombarding the four courts for the past two hours. We were silent. For both of us, it was the end of a dream. June the 28th, 1922. Since first light, the Irish National Army has maintained constant fire on the Republican headquarters in the four courts. The Four Courts is getting bombarded from every direction. From one gun alone, there were 375 shells fired. So multiply that by three. Within the Four Courts, the IRA men and coming Amman women are stunned by the onslaught. The anti-treaty IRA in the Four Courts, they have no plan. Partially, it's because they just didn't psychologically expect the war to start. Really, just fundamentally, they, they thought they were going to find a way of avoiding this. On the third day, a National Army shell hits the records office to the rear, where the IRA has stored munitions. A vast explosion rocks the city centre. I was there for the big explosion. This great noise came. And the place, it shook, and rubble or light stuff slithered down my back. Huge mushroom cloud, like an, an atomic weapon, rose over Dublin City, mortalised in, in a photograph from the time. A shower of paper from the public record office, so the archive going back to the 12th century, you know, littered down in Dublin in fragments. The explosion seemed to give an extra push to roaring orange flames which formed patterns across the sky. It can't be long now, I thought, until the real noise comes. With the four courts in flames, Republicans evacuate. That building is captured. 
and much of the IRA executive is captured. It looks like the anti-treaty militants have been decapitated. Most of the 180 strong Four Courts garrison is arrested, including leaders Rory O'Connor, Liam Mellows and Joe McKelvey. A few Republicans, including Ernie O'Malley and the future Taoiseach, Sean Lamas, escape, aided by former IRA comrades now on the Free State side. With the Four Courts collapsing, a force of 700 anti-treaty IRA men and coming among women assembles in the city centre. Here they take over buildings, including many on Sackville Street, now O'Connell Street, through which they knock passages to create one continuous block. Senior Republican political leaders turn up in support. Eamon de Valera shows up, Sean T. O'Kelly shows up, Cahill Brewer shows up, who were all ministers from before the, the split in the Dáil government. You have about 30 women in that line of hotels on the east side of O'Connell Street where the fighting moves. They're loading guns, they're taking an extremely active military role at that stage. National Army troops move into the city under the command of two veterans of the War of Independence, Waterford native Richard Mulcahy and the 24-year-old former British Army captain Emmett Dalton. The GPO, where six years previously Irish rebels proclaimed a republic, now becomes a key National Army position. The IRA is well armed, but the National Army has superior British guns supplied under the orders of British Secretary of State for War, Winston Churchill. Once the attack on the Four Courts began, Churchill became wildly enthusiastic and promised the provisional government whatever military assistance it wanted. That's Churchill's attitude. It's incredible relief. If you need military help, no problem. We're not going to let you lose this war. Buildings in the city centre are engulfed in flames as the conflict rages over several days and nights. There wasn't any respect for property. They blew to bits, shops, hotels, any positions taken up by the anti-treaty side. So the east side of O'Connell Street, which had survived, the 1916 Rising, a lot of that was levelled in, in the battle for Dublin. Police and army struggled to keep curious onlookers away from the fight. People were living just a block behind O'Connell Street and they came out to see what was happening. And I suppose there was disbelief. And unfortunately, you do have a number of civilians that were caught in the crossfire. In crossfire, 35 civilians are killed including several young children. Pathetic sights. In one house, two children lay dead. Owing to conditions outside, it was undesirable to remove the bodies. After a week's fighting, the National Army prepares a major assault to finish the anti-treaty Republicans off completely. We attacked O'Connell Street at 1 a.m. Shot up every post, particularly the Hammond and the Gresham hotels, which were also bombed with rifle grenades. It's not long before the anti-treaty side accept their position is lost. We tried to pray. Someone started the rosary. The walls shook. We were almost covered with dust and whitewash, but we were alive. Defeated, anti-treaty IRA and Common Naman step into the morning light. But one of their leaders, Cahal Brua, former minister of Doyle Erin and hero of the 1916 rebellion, refuses to surrender. He escapes into a rear alley where he is shot by a Free State bullet. Brua becomes the first senior leader of either side to die in the Civil War. This was a symbolic death of a man who was a brave and honourable man, and his death was deeply regretted even by those who disagreed with him on most issues of the time. As the dust settles and guests who've been evicted from their hotels scurry to safety, the costs of the Battle of Dublin become clear. The city centre is in ruins. 
500 Republicans are imprisoned. 81 people have been killed. In London, Winston Churchill and General Neville Macready, commander of the remaining British forces still in Ireland, greet the news that the Irish Provisional Government has effectively suppressed the anti-treaty resistance with relief. Macready writes to an acquaintance of his, it was probably impossible for us to put down the rebels, but now the Irish are doing it and they appear to be having a great deal of success. Remember, the long goal of the British is to have Ireland stable. This is the pioneer new form of dominion status that they have tried to experiment with in Ireland. They've given Ireland more than they've given anywhere else. They want this to work. The other dominions are watching. Britain's continued involvement in the new Irish state's affairs, however, enrages Republicans. England has again waged war upon us. This time she has employed Irish men to do her dirty work. I regret to say that this latest phase of Ireland's struggle is bound to be more terrible than anything that has yet occurred. The provisional government has triumphed in Dublin. A lot of the kind of the senior generals in the National Army thought that was going to be the end of it. What they didn't anticipate was that the attack on the Four Courts would be seen as an attack on the Republic and that the anti-treaty forces across the country would mobilize, and they mobilized really rapidly. And what had started as a, an attack on one building or series of buildings in the Dublin city center soon spread across the country and became a national struggle. Once the anti-treatyites were forced out of the city, a hardening does take place among the rest of the Republican forces. And people like Liam Lynch, he feels he's been strung along by the pro-treatyites, that they weren't really serious about peace, that ultimately they've gone ahead and carried out Britain's wishes. So from now on, it's war. Beyond Dublin, anti-treaty Republicans already controlled most of the country, including large tracts of Munster and Connacht. The first weeks of July are scarred by violent clashes across the state as the two sides struggle for control. Enniscorthy is taken after heavy fighting by 250 anti-treaty IRA men under the command of Ernie O'Malley. New Ross falls to Sean Moylan's unit of 230 men. Once the civil war is underway, political leaders of the anti-treaty side, including Eamon de Valera, who had been a pivotal force in the independence struggle, are relegated to the margins. De Valera frankly admitted in private that he was quite powerless during this period. Those in senior positions in the IRA are not listening to him. He is losing control of the movement. Military control of the movement rests for the most part with two commanders, 26-year-old clerk from Cork, Liam Deasy, and 29-year-old former shop assistant from Limerick, Liam Lynch. Lynch sets about building a Republican stronghold in the southwest. It becomes known as the Monster Republic. Liam Lynch's notional defensive line protecting the Munster Republic runs from Limerick in the west, bordered to the north by the River Shannon, across Tipperary to Waterford City in the east, flanked by the River Shore. Republicans control most of the province of Munster. They form an IRA police force and attempt to maintain the railways. The anti-treatyites are in a position where they're almost running their own kind of cobbled together state in the first month or so of the Civil War. Unlike the National Army, the IRA have to feed, equip and supply themselves. They're often commandeering things like cars and vehicles and bringing them back, ponies and traps, you know, writing out little receipts for cigarettes and fuel. To feed themselves, they might go in and write a little IOU, a little receipt, you know. The Irish Republic government will will reimburse you at a date to be determined. Such actions strain relationships with the local people, most of whom are already under strain after years of war. Businesses are really uneasy about all this. Unemployment goes through the roof, and the economic cost of this is really apparent to members of the public who are already experiencing part of a recession. They need money, 
And one of the things that they do is take over the port of Cork and they start charging their own customs and tariffs on all the ships arriving there. In just five weeks, the IRA raises £100,000 from port trade in Cork. The money generates confidence. If they can establish a functioning republic in Munster, perhaps they can successfully present a clear alternative to the Anglo-Irish Treaty. But first, they must rally the strength to overcome the combined forces of the Irish Free State. What emotional charge is carrying those on the anti-treaty side? What are they feeling? Todd Andrews, who was just 19 when this conflict started, who's a very young soldier on the anti-treaty side, when he came to write his memoirs, he wrote of that period, I rarely thought, I felt. This is what they were feeling. This sense that they are carrying on a noble mission and a noble continuity of struggle. The National Army's victory in Dublin gives the Irish Free State's provisional government a strong base. Now, it is determined to suppress all Republican resistance and build a functioning state. We fight for the right of the people of Ireland to decide any issue, great or small, that arises in the politics of this country. That right is sacred. British propaganda has for decades suggested that the Irish are too violent and disorderly to govern themselves. The absolute chaos that is unleashed by the opposition to the treaty, by the civil war, looks really bad. They want to impress upon the former colonial masters or whatever that, look, we're telling you, we're capable of doing this. 31-year-old Michael Collins, chairman of the provisional government and commander-in-chief of the National Army, believes that his duty is to protect the Free State. If this necessitates fighting the anti-treaty Republicans, then so be it. And yet, Collins and General Richard Mulcahy, having both played key roles in the struggle for independence, remain hopeful they can persuade former comrades in the Republican movement to abandon their armed resistance to the state. Every constitutional way is open to them to win the people over to their side, and we will meet them in every way if they only accept the authority of the government. People like Arthur Griffith, Kevin O'Higgins, who are much more confident that there's an important political and constitutional issue at stake, that democracy, the right of the people, should prevail over what they would see as almost kind of an anarchic or a criminal threat that the free state are facing. The June general election has given pro-treaty candidates a clear majority. Despite this mandate, Collins has not yet summoned the new parliament. The civil war, therefore, has no parliamentary sanction. This is the charge that has been made against Collins. Since there was no parliament in existence in Dublin, there was in fact a military dictatorship under Collins. Was that appropriate in a democracy? No, obviously not. Was it necessary in the circumstances? Many people would feel it was. On the outset of the Civil War, the National Army has just 8,000 men. Though better armed, there are fears they will struggle against the potentially 80,000 men in the anti-treaty IRA. A major recruitment campaign gets underway, which at its height sees up to 1,000 men enlisted per day. And you have these recruitment officers set up all over the city, and they flood in strength, and you did not have to have any previous service. Among new recruits, are former IRA men and battle-hardened veterans of the Great War. Others, like Dublin man William Heaney, enlist for the wage and are proud to serve their new state. Uniforms are cobbled together. Arms are supplied by the British government. Under pressure of time, not all recruits are of the ideal standard. We had to get work out of a disgruntled, undisciplined and cowardly crowd. Sentries were drunk at their posts. A whole garrison was put in the clink for insubordination. So the army was undisciplined and often behaved brutally. And many members of the provisional government were appalled at the way in which the misconduct of the army was tainting their cause. 
With little time for training, the National Army spread south and west from strongholds in Dublin, the Curra and Athlone. Drawing on his First World War and War of Independence experience, General Dalton plans strategically. Emmett Dalton in particular was imaginative in deciding that there's no point in blasting our way into Cork, Kenmare and other towns or cities. Let's take them by sea. Dalton commandeers civilian ships, which will carry thousands of troops. Their orders attack the Munster Republic and defeat the anti-treaty Republicans. In the first wave of the Civil War, the National Army captures Galway City from the IRA as thousands of troops spread across the country by land and sea. When you really think of what is important militarily in terms of dominating Ireland militarily, it's control of Dublin, and then to break up the lines of communication between the IRA units in the south, in the southwest and in the northwest. In Wexford and Limerick, Sligo and Mayo, National Army troops encounter strong resistance from IRA units. Gun battles flare throughout the country. The spread of war angers the public. Some call on Dáil Éireann to convene immediately to find a solution. On both sides of the treaty divide, there are widespread calls for peace. We declare ourselves not satisfied that such a disastrous fratricidal strife is unavoidable. We request Dáil Éireann to call an armistice. For now, however, this conflict has an unstoppable momentum. Mid-July, the National Army closes in on Limerick, gateway to the south and west. Control of Limerick is fundamental to the outcome of the Civil War. Liam Lynch is in a dominant position in Limerick City. Lynch, Liam DC have 700 battle-hardened veterans of the War of Independence under their command. With the main army barracks under their full control, the anti-treaty forces believe they can achieve a bloodless victory over the National Army in Limerick. When National Army officers ask him for a truce, Liam Lynch grants it. But the National Army uses the truce to build forces and artillery around the city. And after days of talks, they strike. The situation has got very serious. Free State troops have swarmed into the city like bees and occupied practically all the posts we had last week. Casualties reported among our men. In the Battle of Limerick, which lasts nine days, 700 IRA volunteers engaged close to 2,000 National Army troops. Eventually, the IRA are overwhelmed by superior firepower and organisation. In retreat, the IRA set the barracks alight. The conflict leaves 22 people, including 11 civilians, dead. It was the saddest period in our history. The comrades of yesterday, killing one another. Conditions in Limerick Jail were deplorable. Our girls did all they could to help the prisoners. On the same day Limerick falls, Free State forces enter Tipperary and Waterford City. Lynch's illusory defensive line has vanished and the heartland of the Munster Republic in Cork and Kerry is exposed to pro-treaty advance from Limerick. The collapse of Limerick stuns Liam Lynch. From now on there will be no further negotiations. The IRA leadership is in turmoil. Some argue they must abandon conventional tactics and embark on a guerrilla war. Others, including Lynch, argue that a retreat to the hills would demoralise the men and alienate the public further. Ernie O'Malley writes letters criticising his fellow IRA leaders' strategic abilities. 
Ernie O'Malley is concerned that training is being neglected, that they are not on top of their intelligence efforts. He frequently complains throughout uh, the Civil War about the shortcomings uh, of the Republican movement. But that's not the message, of course, that they are promoting publicly, which is very much one of defiance and unity. The moment the, the treaty is signed, the propaganda war begins. The Free State Administration, and particularly the Catholic Church, the newspapers and so on, very effectively demonise the Republicans, delegitimise them. Irregulars, brigands, um, irreconcilables, uh, parasites. It's an othering process. It's powerful language, and it's saying that the respectable people are on the side of the treaty and the brigands and the irregulars are anti-treaty. It's demonizing the anti-treaty forces. The goal was to delegitimize the enemy, and that discrediting and delegitimizing was really critical because both sides were claiming to be the inheritors of the revolutionary tradition. Anti-treaty Republicans also tried to fight a propaganda war. In areas under anti-treaty IRA control, you have censorship as well in propaganda, so the anti-treatyites take over the Cork Examiner, so it puts the anti-treaty spin on war news. Come in Amman sets up a propaganda department within Dublin and people like Sheila Humphreys and Maura Comerford go out and put slogans on the wall before six o'clock in the morning. The spirit of Cahill Brewer lives, uh, the Republic will never die. By late July 1922, Dublin, Galway, Limerick and most of the East and Midlands are firmly under state control. As they abandon positions, the IRA cut communications, block roads and bridges. Local economies come to a standstill. People fear theirs will be the town or village next to be destroyed. When National Army troops successfully capture Westport from the sea, they are celebrated by most of the townspeople. National forces arrived by sea on Monday night and were received with wild enthusiasm by the people when they landed at the quay. I think the majority of the population basically want normality. They want to into all this madness and murder and mayhem. You had an overall feeling of deep concern and stress and worry amongst the vast majority of the population. With options diminishing, some IRA units decide for themselves to switch to the guerrilla tactics that had served them so well against the British. So we have ambushes like Abbey Leash on 28th of July when uh, a group of the National Army are surprised by a bomb and five soldiers are killed. Ambushing is a tactic we've seen since the War of Independence and that's because it's one of the few things open to you because you just don't have the resources and the manpower of the other side. I guess it becomes a little bit more controversial when we get into the Irish Civil War because we've got men who previously fought alongside each other fighting against each other. Civil wars have long been seen as particularly corrosive and destructive and traumatizing to communities because subjectively experienced when you're in a civil war, you feel as if you're fighting other members of your community. It's that sense of the horror of recognizing oneself in the eyes of one's enemy. I see myself in you, we are part of the same blood. I've seen brothers fighting brothers Fathers fighting sons, even. And I actually saw two brothers, one with an axe and the other with the hammer, trying to attack each other. Well, there was blood everywhere. As the violence escalates, the Catholic Church aligns increasingly against the Republicans. What they view is that the lawless nature of our society since the War of Independence is leading people down a bad path. 
that they have lost their natural deference to authority. And the Republican movement is really responsible for it. And what they need to do is to get the natural order back in place. In the final week of July, the conflict moves to a triangle south of Limerick between Brewery, Brough and Kilmallock. Here, the largest pitched battle of the Irish Civil War will be fought. Kilmallock represents a strong barrier to any free state advance on the heartland of the Munster Republic. Republicans move over 1,000 well-armed IRA men with coming them on support into the surrounding area. The National Army attempts to encircle them, but the IRA is well prepared. The Republicans actually push back pretty well. They capture a couple hundred National Army soldiers. The incoherence of civil war reveals itself starkly as the battle unfolds. Confident of success. As any time forces have met in this area, the enemy ran away. There was this phony war going on. As a civil war, this was a tame affair compared to the Spanish Civil War or the Finnish Civil War or the Hungarian Civil War. There was a great reluctance to fight. The difficulty really is that, as in many commanders on both sides of the report, there are guys who just don't want to fire on their old friends. Republicans were somewhat reluctant to engage the enemy. They weren't taking the offensive often enough. A phrase you often hear in the memoirs and accounts of veterans is that their heart wasn't in it. I had not a desire to kill the enemy. The officers who were operating against us were our own former friends. IRA volunteers are unpaid. Some are reluctant to operate beyond their home county. Others, frustrated by strategic failures, simply abandon the fight and go home. There's no doubt demoralization set in very early. Through several days fighting, the National Army marshals its armoured cars and artillery to good effect and builds a cordon around Republican positions until the Republicans are forced once more to retreat. Kilmallock is the third major defeat for the anti-treaty side. Across Ireland, thousands of anti-treaty sympathisers and operatives have been arrested. Just five weeks since the war began, the Republicans are in disarray. The prisons are overflowing with Republicans, men and women. There is just mass internment, so they're just rounding up people. In Northern Ireland, Unionist leader James Craig watches the war in the Irish Free State unfold with interest. Since January, Northern Ireland has experienced its own kind of civil war between nationalist and unionist communities. Hundreds were killed in Belfast alone in the first months of 1922. But the outbreak of civil war in the Free State has brought a dramatic change. The Unionist regime is having a very tricky time. If you're in the Belfast government, every day is a crisis. Every day you feel the ice cracking under your feet. And what changes that is the outbreak of the civil war. It meant that the Ulster Unionists were freer to consolidate their regime, especially because the Northern IRA largely and overwhelmingly went south. The IRA in the north, most of them joined Free State forces. There is overwhelming support for the treaty in the north, both among the IRA and the broader nationalist population. Because it looks like a solution, it looks like it will resolve something. There is a real desire for peace, for some kind of stability. This effectively means that those IRA forces in the North who had been hitherto operating against partition 
are now, to all intents and purposes, decommissioned, taken away from the North and embroiled in the conflict over the future of the treaty and over the future of the provisional government. From Craig's point of view, this is a great break. For Northern Republicans who do stay in Northern Ireland, they find that their position is really undermined and Craig's government is in a position to bring in a really draconian suppression of the IRA. So the Irish Civil War also means essentially the collapse of Northern Republicanism as a political force for several generations. And that has a traumatic impact on Northern Catholics. August 2, 1922, 800 National Army troops approached the North Kerry coastline by sea. Though local IRA men put up a strong defence, both Feenet and then Tralee fall to the Free State. Meanwhile, General Dalton moves an even greater naval force towards the south coast. Here he plans to strike three separate targets at the same time, Yall, Union Hall and Cork City. From there, the National Army hopes to encircle Republican forces in Munster. But the IRA foresees the naval strategy and barricades the River Lee with mines. The British Navy informed Dalton's Free State Landing Party about the position of mines in the harbour. The tip-off allows Dalton to change course and he successfully lands 800 men at Passage West. Dalton's troops easily push aside a small IRA garrison and march towards Cork. Hundreds of IRA rush from the city in neighbouring battlefronts to stop the Free State advance. Here in Rochestown, the two sides meet and a major battle ensues. A consistent thread throughout this whole conventional phase is any place the Republicans put up pretty good stubborn resistance, the Free State just brings in artillery and just blasts them out. And that's what happens in, in Roach's town. Dozens of Free State soldiers are killed and wounded. But again, the Republicans are soon overwhelmed and retreat. On August the 10th, the National Army enters Cork unopposed. The capital of the Munster Republic has fallen. As news of the advance of the National Army arrives in the city, the IRA set fire to the police and military barracks. And it is stated that the city was enveloped in a pall of smoke. It's basically chaos, anarchy. Locals take advantage of the chaos. Businesses, shops and barracks are looted. I think it's important to understand the extent of poverty in Irish society at the time. You've really got to understand how desperate people are. There's a shortage of bread. There's a shortage of fuel. So looting is very prevalent. As the Republicans melt away from the city and into the countryside, the National Army is actually warmly welcomed. In the six weeks since the attack on the Four Courts, the National Army has pushed the IRA out of most of Leinster and Connacht. Now, with most of Munster under Free State control, people feel the conflict must be over. By the middle of August 1922, they controlled practically every town, every urban centre in the country, across the territory of the state. And so the parts that they didn't succeed in getting on top of, places like South Wexford, parts of Kerry, Mayo, these were very much places which didn't have that much strategic importance. So it's a really one-sided conflict. And the only reason I'm saying is that it might have been otherwise is that the greater numbers at the start of the Civil War were with the anti-treatyites. The fall of Cork City brings the conventional phase of the Irish Civil War to an end. A new, 
more terrible phase is to come. In the days that follow the taking of Cork, the National Army pushes west as it routes the IRA. We were kept moving from the time we started until we took over every town, every village, every stronghold of the others in the area. The anti-treaty Republicans did not have the resources, the strategy, or the public support to be remotely capable of winning the Civil War. In conventional warfare terms, the Civil War is over very quickly. It was seen as quite demoralizing for the Republicans, for the IRA, for coming them on. An unknown story is that maybe between the time the treaty was signed and let's say September 22, many, many people who had been involved in the IRA might have gone home and decided not to fight. There was that process of demobilization, which is quite spontaneous. And after they put up the fight for Dublin, after they were unable to defend the so-called Munster Republic, many people would have concluded that we cannot win this civil war. While many more IRA men abandoned the war, thousands vowed to fight on. There is an order by Liam Lynch, the chief of staff of the IRA, that they go to the mountains and are going to revert to the guerrilla tactics that they used in the War of Independence. They just end up in very remote places. So they end up in the mountains of uh, West Sligo, West Mayo, Connemara, just because these places are inaccessible to Free State soldiers. There's very few roads. So they're living in dugouts in the hills. And a lot of them are just surviving there. They were living in culverts and in dugouts and in makeshift old tents and in woods and desperate conditions and lice and fleas and, and not able to wash and not able to get a proper night's sleep. Common Amman women and some locals tried to maintain links and supplies. A column now was four men short of ammunition, hiding in a dripping dugout. I was a courier now, trying to maintain links. Sometimes I would return to a place and find the unit no longer there. Two days after the fall of Cork, Arthur Griffith, founder of Sinn Féin and president of Dáil Éireann, dies of a brain hemorrhage. It's hard to get away from the fact that he must have had an extremely stressful job at that point. We forget what was going on politically. From January 22, the provisional government was hard at work in setting up what would become the Free State. The loss of so influential a figure in Ireland's independence struggle shocks the nation. Michael Collins attends the funeral in full uniform. What Collins is portraying is that sense of control. We are in control of this situation. And that perhaps the most high profile individual in Ireland at that time is at the head of a national army that is fighting for your future. One week after Griffith's funeral, Collins travels by armoured convoy to Cork. Though the risks of travelling in countryside still contested by the IRA are high, Collins is intent on strengthening free state control over his home county. He is also concerned about the harbour revenue and the tax revenue that has been diverted by the Republicans. And Collins is there to get that money. Then he decides he's going to make a tour of inspection around West Cork. It's actually pretty reckless. Here you had probably one of the most important people in the country. 
heading into an area controlled by his adversaries in an open top car that was painted yellow. So on the 22nd of August, Michael Collins drives through the crossroads at Belle Nablois. There's a pub there. They asked somebody who came out of the pub for directions to Bandon. What they didn't know was that the person they got directions from was an IRA sentry who was guarding IRA officers from across Cork who happened to be having a big meeting at Belle Nablois. Inside the pub, the IRA officers are discussing whether to follow Lynch's orders to form flying columns and fight a guerrilla war. Collins, unaware of how close he has come to the IRA leadership, drives away. But the IRA men know that his convoy must return by this same road because they have blown up or blocked nearly every other road in West Cork. The decision is made. Set an ambush and wait for Collins's convoy to return to Bay Nablau. It's a very interesting sight because I travel that you have the main road and parallel to the main road you have a lane and the lane overlooks the main road and provides very, very good cover. So it's a perfect location for an ambush. The IRA build a roadblock on the main road. Sentries cover the blockade from the lane above. They waited for hours. The convoy didn't turn up. They were in the process of moving away when Collins and his men did arrive, and a small number of IRA volunteers then opened fire. Collins orders the convoy to stop and engage fire. When the IRA rearguard moves to retreat, Collins leaves the cover of his armoured car to get a clear shot from his rifle at the IRA men fleeing up the lane above. General Emmett Dalton was with Collins on that final journey. I thought I heard a voice calling me, and I jumped up, and at that stage, O'Connell had come up the road to me, and he said, where's the big fellow? So I said, he's around the corner. And we both went up there, and he had been shot. He was lying there with a very gaping wound to the back of his head. The death of Collins is the great public tragedy of the Civil War. He was the most high-profile casualty he was only 31. Michael Collins's killing sent shockwaves throughout Ireland and beyond. His engaging personality won friendships even amongst those who first met him as foe. Nearly one in every five people in the country turns up to pay their respects. Whether you were on the pro-treaty or the anti-treaty side, you understood that Michael Collins had been such a key figure in getting to where they were at that stage, particularly during the War of Independence. Vast crowds, several hundred thousand strong, watched Collins's cortege move through Dublin. At his graveside in Glasnevin, Richard Mulcahy calls for tolerance on all sides. But Collins's death has hardened hearts within the provisional government. They're living in government buildings and they're surrounded by a protective core because they were afraid of being assassinated if they moved about. The alarm is about the threat of the social fabric unravelling and some kind of a, a revolution taking place if things are allowed to disintegrate. There's a lot of fear of revolution getting out of control in this period. The civil war everyone's talking about is the one that's happening you know, in Russia and the kinds of violences and atrocities that can come out of a civil war situation. There's this fear of anarchy. There's this fear of those who the provisional government are kind of depicting as the wild men outside the door, screaming through the door. This kind of sense of, of everything collapsing and the need for law and order. Inside government buildings, the cabinet is grimly determined. The Republicans must be overcome. Richard Mulcahy replaces Collins 
as Commander-in-Chief of the National Army. W.T. Cosgrave takes over as Chairman of the Provisional Government. But certainly there was a change on the government side, a new toughness, a new impatience, a new intolerance of what was seen as impossible, destructive, malevolent behaviour on the part of the Republicans that must be fought and fought harshly and, if necessary, brutally. Cosgrave vows that his government will stop at nothing to put an end to the threat to the Irish Free State. I am not going to hesitate. If the country is going to live and if we have to execute 10,000 Republicans, the three millions of our people are bigger than the 10,000. In the coming months, the Free State Government will execute 81 of its citizens in the name of democracy and defence of the new state. National Army soldiers will maim and murder many more. Republicans will counterattack, bringing devastation and terror to communities throughout the island. Once you've crossed the Rubicon, a metaphor that comes from the Roman civil wars, once you've crossed the Rubicon, there's no going back. The months ahead will forever darken Ireland's revolutionary struggle and give rise to a legacy of bitterness and shame that will linger for generations. <laughs>